Good Wednesday morning. It's April 7th, 2021. I'm Guy McPherson of Nature Bats Last. You can find Nature Bats Last at GuyMcPherson.com. If you go over to GuyMcPherson.com right now, you can find links to the papers I'm going to mention in this science update. Starting with a paper from Fizz.org, March 19th, 2021, titled Declining Caribou Population, Victim of Ecological Chain Reaction. Hmm, ecological chain reaction. That sounds kind of curious. I wonder what that means. From the peer-reviewed article published January 20th, 2021 in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Yes, there's actually an A too. There are two proceedings published by the Royal Society. The title of this paper is Trophic Consequences of Terrestrial Eutrophication for a Threatened Ungulate, which is a classic example of how scientists separate themselves from the rest of the people on the planet by using nine-syllable words that nobody knows what they mean. It's authored by Robert Seroya and 10 other authors. And from the abstract, Canadian boreal, boreal forests are undergoing some of the most rapid changes of land use change on Earth and are home to declining caribou populations. Caribou has one of the more interesting scientific names, Latin names, I've ever come across. Rangifer tarandus caribou. Isn't that poetic? Using satellite-derived estimates of primary productivity coupled with estimates of moose, alces, alces, and wolf, Canis lupus, abundance, we use path analysis to discriminate among hypotheses explaining how habitat alteration can affect caribou population growth. Results support apparent competition and yield estimates of wolf densities above which caribou populations decline. Our multitrophic analysis provides insight into the cascading effects of habitat alteration from forest cutting that destabilize terrestrial predator-prey dynamics. Finally, the path analysis highlights why conservation actions directed at the proximate cause of caribou decline have been more successful in the near term than those directed further along the trophic chain. And the primary reason I wanted to bring this paper to your attention was that they talk a lot about hypotheses in this paper, and they don't have the slightest idea what they mean. So many people are confused about hypotheses, including most scientists. And because of my disappointment with those other scientists, most notably including graduate students with whom I was working and their faculty advisors, I wrote a paper, April 4, it was published April 1st, 2001, in the American Biology Teacher, and it's called Teaching and Learning the Scientific Method. And I point out in this paper a few interesting points that most scientists continue to misunderstand. Specifically, misuse of the word hypothesis obfuscates genuine understanding of the scientific method. We routinely use the term hypothesis when we mean prediction. This unacceptable substitution dilutes the power of the scientific method to the extent that invoking the scientific method has become largely meaningless. And I give an example. Hypothesis is a candidate explanation. It's a reason why something is happening. It's not merely a prediction. Consider for the example, Consider, for example, the prediction, quote, there are no living organisms on Mars. Is that a prediction? Is that a hypothesis? It's a prediction, not a hypothesis. It doesn't have anything to do with explaining a pattern. It just says, I don't think there's anything out there on Mars. Evaluating this prediction requires sophisticated technology. It does not, however, require use of the scientific method complete with hypothesis test testing and formulation. So, if we're not going, if we're going to use the scientific method the way that most people use it, which is a prediction, then science and the scientific method are not different from everyday activities. Consider, for example, 
If we're going to use predictions and call them hypotheses, we can apply those to everyday actions, like mowing the lawn. The grass is too long in some spots, so I must have missed those spots. It's not a hypothesis. Shopping for groceries. I only need milk, so I'll look in the dairy section rather than searching the entire store. You predict where the milk is going to be based on past experience, but you're not coming up with a candidate explanation, a reason why that milk might be there. And so, in other words, science has little to offer beyond everyday activities if observation is the only means by which we acquire reliable knowledge and if we continue to use predictions and call them hypotheses. So, misuse of the term hypothesis and the resulting misunderstanding of the scientific method are not restricted to the American biology teacher, that journal. I suggest that such misuse permeates the scientific literature and scientific searches for pattern. Readers who are interested in documenting the phenomenon need only look to the nearest journal. I recommend starting with science or nature. And the reason I did that is these are among the leading scientific journals in the world, those two, and the authors continue to misunderstand a relatively simple concept that is the difference between hypothesis and prediction. This turned into a teachable moment having very little to do actually with the ecological chain reaction, but I think it's important for people to understand that if we're going to use terms, those terms should have meaning. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for tolerating my mm, ambition at pointing out where people have used wrong terms in the past. I'll try to put together another one of these within the next week. Thank you.